welcome to the worship of our great God and King. Um, it's already uh, November, so the year seems to be flying uh, by. Just a few announcements as we come. Uh, this morning, the uh, rose on the table this morning is in honor of uh, Ricky and Gina's new granddaughter, Riley Ann Smith, who was born this week. And uh, there is evidence of Ricky holding her on Facebook. And so check that out, a beautiful young lady, uh, Ross and Lauren Smith, of course, are her parents. Uh, just a few announcements um, in your bulletin you'll see there. The one thing I want to make note of, uh, we are actually hosting the thanks, community Thanksgiving service. Um, we rotate that around uh, amongst the Baptist and Methodist Church and our church and um, uh, Dennis Thompson's church. And it is here on November the 20th at 6 o'clock. And so I want to encourage as many of you as can to be here. Um, we need to show up because it's at our church. And we need to show up to worship our great God. The other thing that I want to point out, and I'll go ahead and mention it now, is um, to put Sunday, uh, December 4th, uh, on your calendar uh, that's going to be a great, great day at our church. We're really excited about um, that, uh, that meal that night and the program that's coming together for that night. And so please uh, put that uh, time down and, and make every effort uh, to, to, to be here uh, for that. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, the Maker of heaven and earth, You, the Lord that shines in the darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend, You reign in holiness, and no evil and impurity can associate. We call upon your presence as we start today's gathering. Come, O Lord, let every evil and darkness disappear. As we go today, fill our hearts with joy, recharge and refill us with the sweetness of your presence. Empower us to live all the rest of our lives for you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you will all take your hymnals and turn to page three. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. If you will stand with me and let's sing. <clears throat>
Indeed, all the heavens and the earth do praise your name. And Father, as we come into that holy presence, our sinfulness is ever before you. Wash it away in the blood of Jesus Christ. As we confess it to you, O Lord, we come humbly. Lord, assure us of your pardon, that as we come and confess, you remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for that assurance that comes to us in the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior. And we look forward to his return. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Just briefly, I uh, just wanted to uh, mention <clears throat> the insert you see in your bulletin this morning, uh, praise and prayer for some of our missionaries and the different uh, missions that uh, our denomination uh, World Witness supports, as most of you know, uh, through our uh, faith promise givings. Some of that money does go to World Witness uh, in, in some of the uh, missions that uh, they support. So uh, pr please, uh, you'll see these from time to time over the next few months in the uh, bulletin. So please uh, make this part of your uh, daily and weekly prayers to pray for these uh, concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, as he mentioned, these will be in our bulletins um, every couple of months, I think, they're doing them. And um, if you have any questions about uh, World Witness and missions of not only this church, but the denomination, uh, Johnny is our uh, advocate for uh, missions. Uh, he connects directly to Alex and the others at World Witness. And uh, they have started an advocacy program in each church, and Johnny is ably serving in that. This was the last week of um, Operation Christmas Child, and uh, I wanted to report and pray for the gifts that you have given. Uh, we packed 18 boxes uh, this year. And we received $1,083 uh, in terms of money, I guess both for shipping and for the sustainable items that you see. Well, now it says 20 boxes. So 20 boxes and um, uh, money for all the sustainable items. Monica tells me that uh, people gave all of these, uh, the chickens, the trees, the honeybees, the goats and dairy uh, animals, the clean water projects, and a couple of bikes for missionaries. And uh, so those are things that are tangible that will 
uh, make a real difference in the lives of these families who are in need. But also the boxes bring a great delight uh, to uh, the children who receive them. So let me pray for uh, both the boxes and the money this morning. Lord God, as we come and dedicate uh, our work here uh, from Operation Christmas Child uh, to you, uh, Father, we're thankful for the many blessings that you give out here to our church family. And may we, Father, uh, pass these blessings forward through your work with Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child. Bless the children who will receive these boxes. Um, may they uh, find the joy of Christ in their lives and may these gifts bring a measure of fun and excitement to them. And then, Father, we pray for these sustainable items that will be provided. Uh, we pray that uh, the families who receive them, the missionaries who receive them, will find um, that they aid in just their daily lives, their well-being, and as for particularly for the missionaries as they carry out your kingdom work. Father, we take things like these sustainable items for granted. We turn on the faucet expecting to have clean water. And yet, Lord, we know that there are those that that does not happen in their lives. And so, Father, bless these gifts so freely given for your kingdom, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is taken from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with the trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap Clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Once again, if you will stand with me and take your hymnals and turn to page 170. Give thanks. Mm -hmm.
Our New Testament reading is taken from Luke 20, verses 27 through 38, concerning the resurrection and marriage. Some of the Sadducees who said there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for, for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a, the first one married a woman and died, died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seventh died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Since the seven were married to her. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in, but in the account of the bush, even Moses shows that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. <clears throat> he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Blessed be the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Thank you, Mike. As we come to our prayer time today, uh, two or three uh, specific things that I would mention to you guys. Um, if you'll be praying, I've, I sent an email out about this, but uh, I talked to Jennifer this morning. If you'll be praying for Abby, her daughter, uh, Abby continues to struggle uh, in our hospital here. Uh, she's been there since Friday, I believe, and uh, we need to be praying uh, earnestly for Abby uh, this morning. Also, Beth Braddock reached out to me. Beth took a fall. Um, Yesterday, I believe it was, uh, and um, it's pretty bruised up and banged up, and uh, so we want to pray uh, for her. I uh, certainly want to pray for um, the Harry Jones family um, with his funeral service yesterday. Uh, we want to lift up all the Jones family, and I also want to just take a moment of thanks to all the uh, ladies who helped with that luncheon uh, yesterday, uh, it was very much appreciated uh, by Ms. Jones and her daughters. We want to keep praying for uh, Jake. Uh, Jake uh, communicated with me uh, this past week that he was doing pretty well. He'll uh, start another round of treatment, I think, in the days uh, ahead. Um, and... We continue to pray for Chad, who's doing so well. Uh, we want to continue to lift him up. And others here on our uh, prayer list, um, we want to remember uh, Monica and all of our family, if you would, please, uh, the service this week for, um, for her father. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father God, as we come this morning, we're thankful for your goodness and mercy to us. We're thankful for uh, um, the richness of your blessings uh, to us. We're overwhelmed, O oh Father, at your goodness, and yet there are so many that need your hand upon them. We praise you for the progress that Chad and James Davis and others have made, Lord, James being home now and doing so well. Certainly, Lord, we lift up 
uh, Merlin Jones and all of her family in these days with uh, the passing of uh, Uncle Harry. And Lord, we pray for them that you would be a comfort and a blessing to them. Lord, we would pray for Abby uh, Sandifer in specific this morning and Beth Braddock as well. Father, we pray that you would um, touch them both, bring healing to their bodies, uh, comfort to their minds, encouragement to their spirits, O oh Lord. And for all the others, Lord, on our prayer list, uh, the homebound, certainly, Lord, we lift before your kingdom and the many others who populate this list, O oh Lord, we would come before you and lift them, praying for them, O oh Lord, in these days. Father, there is pain in every pew. We realize that. There are needs all around. And may we come humbly and boldly to you. Father, this month we are praying that you would open our eyes, that you would show us what all we have to be thankful for, and this month that we will celebrate Thanksgiving, may we have thankful hearts, O Lord. We do pray for obedience as well, Father. For that is the sign that we love you and have given our lives over to you. We pray for biblical principles of stewardship that we can continue to bless and support your ministries here, Father. In this month, Lord, we would be praying for women's ministries, for their leadership, uh, for all the hard work that they do here in this church. We praise you for the su success of their uh, outreach program that they had um, a couple of weeks ago. And Father, as they begin to plan for 2023, encourage them uh, in their hearts and may more women here in this church participate there. Father, in the moments as we come to your table, meet us here. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, we don't talk much about money here at this church. Uh, we have been blessed greatly and continue to be greatly blessed through the year. Uh, but as you see from your financial uh, information, we need to close a little gap that we've got before the end of the year. So let me encourage you to give generously uh, because God owns everything there is and has made you steward over the things he has given to you.
Lord God, we are thankful for these gifts given to the, your work of your kingdom. Father, may we be mindful uh, of all that you have given to us. May we be good stewards of it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. You'll be turning in your Bibles to Matthew. Uh, we're going to look at um, the last part of this chapter this morning. Let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's Word and We believe and teach that God's Word is inspired and infallible. Our only rule of faith and practice. Hear the Word of the Lord. Matthew 15, uh, 14, I'm sorry, Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the mountains by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and the, those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. When the men of the place recognized him, they sent around to all the region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touched the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your word. But may we see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. In... 2001, a writer by the name of John Ortberg wrote a very successful book entitled, If You Want to Walk on the Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. And in that book, he centered here on our passage that we have today, and his focus was, how big is your God? I want to come back to that at some point. But the approach I want us to take this morning is to look, first of all, in the context of Matthew, the growing disciples' faith, or the faith that is growing in the disciples, and what we can kind of learn from that. In 1800, I believe it was, there was a Bible printed. Now, we've 
Gina has just taught us about the history of the Bible, and today we had a great start to Nehemiah with Becky Jones, and I would encourage you to come back for Sunday school next week for that, if you weren't here this morning. But the Macklin Bible is one that's not often mentioned, but it is the largest Bible ever printed. It is seven volumes, and it measures an incredible 20 inches tall and 16 inches wide. It is one of the most remarkable Bibles I've ever seen. And it's full of the most amazing engravings of the day. They're printed there within uh, the Bible. And there is an engraving of this scene there that I want to talk about in a minute. Our text says that Jesus, having, having fed the 5,000 men and many more women and children, we said last week maybe ten to 15,000 people from five loaves and two fishes, he immediately, Matthew tells us, dismisses the disciples. He tells them to go get in a boat while he sends the crowd away. He wants them to make for the other side of the lake, and he'll join them later. After all, it's getting late in the evening, and they need to get going. Why does Jesus send the disciples away so quickly? Yes, it was late in the evening. Matthew, as I said, says immediately. But I think that we can glean, if we read this story of the 5,000, which I think I mentioned last week, is found in all four Gospels. The only miracle besides the resurrection found in all four Gospels. I think we can read that story in all four and glean some insight into why Jesus immediately sends the disciples away. When we think about it, Jesus first says here in verse 23 that he wants to go up on the mountain by himself to pray. Jesus values his prayer time. We talked about that great prayer of Nehemiah this morning. And so as we think about Jesus, even though he's the Son of God, he values his prayer time with his Father. And so he's going to go off to pray by himself. Whatever happens on his time in the mountain he's there seemingly praying for eight hours how long does your prayer time last mine doesn't last eight hours i think it was martin luther who said and i've used this quote before but it was martin luther who said on a normal day he prayed for two hours but when he got up and he saw that his day was packed with events, that he was going to be busy from morning until late in the evening. He would pray for four hours. I find myself, and I bet you do too, being exactly the opposite. When you've got a full day, perhaps your prayer time shortens rather than lengthens. But Jesus is there praying. But I I think that we can glean from the other Gospels another reason why Jesus sends the disciples away so quickly. And that is, if we read other accounts, we know that these poor people who were gathered there on the hillside, who had nothing to eat, who lived day to day in that agricultural society on what they had earned the day before, when Jesus 
fed them all out of that small few loaves and fishes, we find out in other Gospels that they wanted to make Jesus king. After all, if, if here's one who can meet our daily bread needs, seemingly out of thin air, this guy needs to be in charge, right? And I think that Jesus, the disciples are just now beginning to really have real faith in him, and I think Jesus does not want the disciples caught up in the frenzy of the crowd wanting to make him something that he was not sent to be. Well, whatever the exact reasons, we know that while he's praying, the disciples are rowing. Now, these are fishermen. They're used to being on the lake. But they're struggling. Their backs are to where they're going. They're rowing as hard as they can, but the wind is against them. They're not making progress. They're tired. They're discouraged. They've been at this for a long, long time. Perhaps even these seasoned fishermen and the others who are not so seasoned are fearful. Our text would lead us to think that at the size of the waves and the power of the wind. Now, evidently, sometime around 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. They see him because they're probably facing that particular shore. And when they see him walking on the water, they think that he is a ghost. Who wouldn't? I mean, when's the last time you saw somebody walking on the water? And in their weariness and in their discouragement of not making any progress and in their fear of the, the storm that's raging there on the lake, perhaps they see it as an omen of their own death. But Jesus speaks into their cries. And he says, take heart, it is I. Don't be afraid. Now, most of us read that, and we kind of go right past this point, but this is one of the most critical verses in all of the story here. Because when Jesus says, take heart, it is I, he is using... The name of God Almighty, it is the same word that we find God using with Moses at the burning bush. When Moses says, who do I tell them has sent me back to lead you out of the land of Egypt? What is your name? I, I don't even know what to call you. And we, of course, interpret the Hebrew letters as Yahweh. I am who I am is who God says at that moment. And Jesus is using the same word here. It is the same word that he uses in all of his I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Tying him to the God Almighty, the Father. And there's no doubt that the disciples hear that When he speaks to them. Then we get to the crazy part, right? Peter. Peter, I think, shows not foolishness, but great faith and courage here. 
Jim Boyce, the great pastor, former pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, said, used to say there were three elements to the real biblical true faith. There were three elements that had to be there for you to have absolute saving faith. The first one was content. You had to know who Jesus is. You had to know what the gospel is all about. We have to know what Jesus accomplished on the cross in his life, death, and resurrection. But then, in addition to content, you had to have assent. That is, you had to believe that. It's one thing to know the facts, it's another thing to believe in them. And so, understanding and accepting both are critical parts of faith. But the last element that Boyce always said had to be there was not just um, content, not just believing it or assenting to it but you had to commit to it you had to commit to it that was what was required to finally have real saving faith and so peter shows all three here doesn't he he says lord if it is you command me to come out onto the water He was committed when the others were scared. And he gets out of the boat. Man, to have that opportunity to walk on the water. And so he gets out of the boat and begins to walk towards Jesus. But then, oh, but then, what happens to Peter so often happens to us. It says, Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out. The engraving in the Macklin Bible, which is my favorite engraving in that book, shows the disciples in the boat scared to death, shows Jesus reaching out to Peter, and you're, you're, you're looking at Jesus' back, and, and you're looking at Peter's face as he has started to sink, and he's reaching his hand out, and the, the engraver overcompensates for his eyes. So he's got these saucer-sized eyes seemingly wide open in terror as he begins to sink. Doesn't this often happen to you and to me? We, 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 we have our eyes on Jesus, but we let our circumstances get in the way of our faith. When we, when we can't see it, we can't touch it, we just got to trust it, and so often we too begin to sink. But, but Peter is right a second time. Not only does he have the faith to get out of the boat, but he's got the intelligence to cry out to Jesus. Lord, save me, he says. And Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and took hold of him. Jesus did not let him sink, and he will not let you sink. And then they get into the boat together, and the wind, of course, dies down immediately. And then... Don't miss verse 33. It is a first-time event in all of Scripture. For the first time, Scripture tells us that when this had happened, 
and Jesus gets into the boat with the disciples, their faith has come to a point now where they truly worship Him. You are the Son of God. So as we come to the table, let me give you just a couple of quick lessons. When we take our eyes off Jesus, bad things can happen. The circumstances of life are what pull our eyes away from Jesus. The idols of our minds, the busyness or whatever it might be of your day, pull us away from Jesus. But the next lesson is the comfort. And that is, Peter was never closer to Jesus than when he began to sink. For Jesus reaches out and takes hold of him. When life starts to crash all around you, we can be like Peter and reach out. And lastly, let me just ask this How big is your God? How big is this one who walks on the water in your life. If he calls you to step out of the boat, are you willing to do that? Or do you like the safety and the comfort of your surroundings too much? Maybe it's to step out in faith in a ministry here. Maybe it's to step out in faith to speak to that one who's not a believer that you're around every day. Whatever God is calling you to step out in in faith, I would just tell you that we serve a mighty big God. One who is capable of doing, even as Becky mentioned this morning, more than we can ever hope for or even imagine. Amen. Father, bless us. May we have a really big view of you. May we live out that faith as well. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the table this morning for anybody who has not had communion with us, we come forward in the old Scottish tradition as good Presbyterians would, and take it as family, covenant family. And so we'll serve two groups, so I'll invite one group down and they'll receive the elements and then return and another group can come. But this table is not the table of Louisville Presbyterian Church at all. It is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so even as I ask you last week and during the week to prepare yourself, I pray that you have prepared yourself to come and meet Jesus here. And if you haven't, it's okay to stay where you are and not participate, for Paul warns us about eating and drinking in a manner that is unworthy. And so if you've confessed your sins, if you have a great relationship and a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, come, feast on His body and His blood. Hear the words from Paul in the institution of our Lord Jesus Christ. For I receive from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which He was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do 
proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. May we pray. Father God, we pray that you would set apart from a common to a sacred use these elements, that we might meet you here in the beauty and glory of the supper. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, after the supper, he gave thanks as we have done in his name. And he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. I'll invite whoever would like to come first down and the elders to come and serve. This is my body broken for you. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Go in the peace of the Lord with the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As these return to their seats, I would invite the rest of you to come forward.
This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for you for the remission of your sin. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though it was in the form of God, did not take equality with God, thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Go in the peace and the power of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we have met you at this table, we've partaken of the elements. Strengthen us with your body. Cleanse us with your blood. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the gospel, we read that after the Last Supper, they sang a song before they went out. And so let's stand together, open our hymnals to the back, and we'll sing the first and the last verse of the song of thanksgiving.
Receive now the benediction. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you all until he comes again and forevermore. Amen.